Hello everyone, this is Casey uh, coming to you with a security flash from BugCrowd. Uh, we're going to talk today about MoveIt. Um, I'm coming to you from uh, InfoSec EU in London and I have with me Adam, uh, who is not in London right now. Adam, you want to say hello? Hey, uh, currently on the other side of the world, so lots of fun. Yeah, we we, we lined this one up perfectly. We're almost, you could drill a hole straight through the planet and I'd probably pop out next door. <laughs> but uh, yeah, we're, we're here talking about uh, MoveIt today. Um, so the uh, the the MoveIt vulnerabilities and the exploitation around MoveIt has has definitely been you know talk of, of this particular conference. Um, it's been one of those um, kind of internet trash fires where you've got meetings and all of a sudden people have to disappear because there's the stuff that they have to go off and deal with um, at, a, at a at a rapid rate. That's been happening uh, more than usual uh, at, uh, at at this event, and that's a thing that happens sometimes. I think it's indicative of the fact that there's there's a, a pretty kind of large event taking place on the internet, which. It's something that you know people have been talking about now for for a week or more, but um, you know, we wanted to get together and just talk through the vulnerabilities that exist and some of the analysis that uh, that Adam and the team have done on on this particular issue. So, Adam, uh, take it away. So, what we're looking at is first off, move it to a very popular piece of software. You might even have it and you don't realize it because mm -hmm. it's heavily used across large organizations. You move it. Uh, you can use it for both internally and externally, share files to an external contractor, maybe contracts, HR information, and it's it's outward bound. So it's very outward focused. Um, you install it on your own system. So you self-host it usually within an org. So if you've got an older, more mature organization, they're going to hold it for a longer period of time as well. Um, the big part about it is it's usually external facing and has a lot of sensitive information. Um, so what's happened is back in May of 2023, people started spotting these little exploitations of the app, um, small, uh, SQL injection vulnerabilities, which are not so small. They're pretty bad when you get those. Um, but it was kind of like and, sporadic, sporadic detection of attacks. Um, yeah, was there were some small organizations up? doing IR, uh, probably a couple of flags popped up in a blue team's yeah, office and went, Oh God. Okay, cool. Yep. Um, so a CVE was released. Uh, that's CVE 2023 34 And the number is the CPSS 9.8, which anything above a nine terrifies the heck out of <laughs> Yeah. Um, and it basically said that everything is vulnerable. Everything's on fire. The fire's on fire. Probably need to go deal with this, especially because... With it, it came with a note saying, we saw mass exploitation of this. Um, a group came out and claimed responsibility. That's the Klopp ransomware gang. Yep. And it's what you would expect. It's a ransomware gang. They're going to try and find large software mm -hmm. that's heavily used across a large amount of organizations, usually externally facing if they can, and target it. Yeah, and just just to, just to pause on that for a second. So when you, when you say externally facing, just making sure that part's clear, you're talking about you know when a company deploys move it. Um, so move it's you know it's file sharing. It's basically a file server and, and a file access system. If you deploy that as an organization, generally you're deploying it facing the public internet. So you don't have it's not restricted to your internal network. You don't have firewalls in front of it. That kind of stuff. It's just out there on 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 the internet, right? Yeah, you usually have it outward facing because maybe yeah. you want to share files with a, another company and you don't want to send it via email. Yep, file access. Yeah, cool. Go on. And we, and as we've seen in the past, obviously ransomware gangs love this sort of stuff. They dream of finding mm -hmm. this sort of little nugget in the dust. Um, but when you find a little bit of gold, there's usually more hidden underneath. And in this case they found two more CVEs. We've got a one that's what is 35036 and 35708, both of which really highly rated, same thing, SQL injection vulnerability, unauthenticated, meaning anyone can just walk up and do the exact same vulnerability on this so you system. Don't need to have a, you don't need to have an account or any kind of you know credentials to, to exploit this vulnerability. You can just literally hit the system across the internet and you're, you're good to yeah, go. You can walk straight up and just knock on the door. Okay. Got it. Yeah. No, it's 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 an interesting one with that one. And you know, we were talking about this just before we joined. Um, it, it feels a little bit like you know these subsequent vulnerabilities that have come out. It feels a little bit like the research clustering that happened with Log4j. So there was that initial you know kind of Log4 shell issue that that blew up and got everyone's attention. But <clears throat> oftentimes when that happens in such such a public or a dramatic way, or if you've got 
you know, a threat actor like Klopp um, exploiting it on, on a mass scale. You know, security researchers, both on the, the white hat and the black hat side, go in and they kind of see that and think, oh, well, there'll be dragons. Um, if there's that kind of vulnerability that's been exploitable, then that, that does tend to indicate that there's probably other things that can be found, you know, in that same piece of software, if not, you know, even in the same code, code paths that were initially exploited. And that seems to seems to be what's happened here, right? Yeah, and there's a lot of researchers who specifically focus in this, well, this sort of range where you look at software that's usually closed source, usually yeah. large scale selling to big, large clients who probably haven't maybe spent as much money on security as they might have in the future. Hmm. Obviously, we can't say because we don't know their security budget. If we did, it would be very terrifying. But at the end of the day, it's, it's usually people who are looking at this sort of stuff and going, okay, there's something here. And there are people who specialize in this, especially in the bug bounty space, which mm. we've seen some, well, you and I know a couple who just focus on that exact thing. Oh, so software, yeah, 100%. And this is one of those bugs where, as well, it's going to be found really quickly. Yep. Um, this sort of software, because it's external facing, you're going to find it really quickly. You're going to find it within a couple of hours, whether you find it or sadly, if someone else finds it. Um, yeah. Yeah. So just, just in terms of like talking about exploitation, cause I, you know, I think we're, we're at, we're at a point in, in the exploitation phase where um, yeah, people just in general on the defender side are aware of the fact that, you know, move it is, is vulnerable. There's active exploitation. There's bad things happening. You know, you, you've got stories of um, you know, government agencies uh, getting trashed by this thing. Um, you know, as I mentioned, uh, there's, there's been you know a number of a number of people that I've been connecting with uh, at, at the conference over the past couple of days that have you know gotten a phone call and had to leave in 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 a bit of a hurry because there's um there's you know active exploitation out of Klopp and and now others it seems are piling as well. Are we seeing anything self propagating um, exploiting this at the moment, or is it is it mostly manual? manual threat actor kind of access well at a certain level we already see um that self-exploitation stage especially with ransomware groups um yeah. they find it's easier to spend that time and just automate those sorts of things so because proof of concepts have already been released you yeah, usually right. find people on the darker side um identifying ways of automating it finding yeah. ways of just speeding up the process and attacking large and larger organizations. Um, you find a little bit of that on the white hat side as well. You get people who focus on stuff like Nuclei, amazing template engine. Yep. They've probably already got templates for this. Sadly, I wasn't able to check right before, but it's what you would expect. Um, once likely. a POC is out, people automate. Yeah, I actually, I actually think I saw that. I saw um, John Hammond and a couple of the guys at, um, at Huntress were doing work on escalating the, the SQL to RCE. Um, and I think someone else picked that up and and um, turned that into a nuclei template. So yeah, same thing. It's like once the once the vulnerability is out there, once the proof of concept code is available, it seems now for all three vulnerabilities, like what that's doing is is basically distributing. It's reducing the ease of access, um, or sorry, increasing the ease of access. So like pretty much anyone can exploit this bug if they want to at this point in time. And as a defender, really, what that means is like if you've got this software, you need to know and you need to fix it pretty much yesterday. Right. And that's a big thing. Like yep. understanding your attack surface is a huge problem. And, and we all know that if you try to I identify every piece of infrastructure inside of an org, you're going to spend weeks and weeks doing that. Yeah. And it's part of the reason why bug bounties are really interesting because it allows you to get those people who are actively motivated looking for these issues and allows you to rapidly deal with them because you've yeah. got that information in front. So yeah, uh, it, it, one of the, one of the things that you were saying, because um, you've actually, I mean, you've you've done work in in enterprise IT environments in past lives, and one of the things that, that we were talking about before is that this is the kind of software that you know can be um, kind of you know someone in the HR team suddenly decides it's a good idea to use Move It, they they put it on their credit card, and all of a sudden you've got you know half the organization's like HR process hanging off this software that might not necessarily be in the asset registry or the cmdb on the it or the security team um this is a this is a kind of a candidate for that right yeah and it's one of those pieces of software where someone has it you might not know about it and it's part of that attack surface problem 
Mm. Um, if you try to spend all your day looking at what's on your network and trying to identify every single piece of software, you're going to spend years and years trying to do that. And that yeah, a little bit of clarification helps. Ultimately, organizations need to do that, but like that's you know the the the, the gap between being able to do that and wanting to is usually quite large. So yeah, I, I guess what you're talking about is positive identification of exploitable software in a situation like this one. Um, okay, I've got move it, um, move it, move it. I can't believe that hasn't memed up harder than. Yeah, I'm sure someone will get to that if they have. We'll get some new stickers made. Okay, yeah, we'll, we'll do the stickers. Yeah, it's good. Um, so I've got move it. Um, what do I do? Like, what, what are my options in terms of actually fixing it? And that's a good part. Since all of these have been released with CVEs, um, it's a collaborative CVE. Um, which means move it has already worked on patches for all of this and right. that's an amazing part it means that you can go right now you can download the patch and install it and because this is also a very important piece of software for a lot of organizations they've supplied what's called drop-in patches which right. means you don't have to take the network offline to go fix this one system you can just fix it now and you don't have to turn it off you just drop it in okay cool so so you can you can basically patch move it without affecting availability of move it to users um that's it because of the way they've designed the patch is what you're saying yeah yeah and the that's... other part of this is there are groups such as cisco talos they've already released indicators of compromise which okay. are basically ways of identifying that the vulnerability has occurred on your system or has been exploited um, yeah. obviously because there's so much complexity here if you really are worried about this sort of stuff you might be worth getting proper incident response to go through and figure out has this been exploited yep. because it's not as simple as it is it working or not because there's so much you have to check yeah got it that makes sense um you know from from a bug crowd standpoint you know again as a, as a defender um i guess you know for, for companies that are running uh ptas with us for companies that are running bug bounty programs i mean this sort of thing can fall out through through a vulnerable disclosure program if, if folks are looking for it but you know i would think you know in a similar kind of vein to log4j if there's any kind of incentive uh incentivized program or you know one where you're actually engaging people to go up and, and look for this type of stuff directing them towards this particular piece of software and saying hey here's a higher reward we suspect that we might have move it in our environment um <clears throat> we've cleaned up the the instances that we're aware of but we don't want to presume that we've found all of it go go look and, and tell us if you if you find something that's that would be one approach to identifying kind of shadow like shadow it instances i guess is the thing that i'm, I'm concerned about at this point in time because everyone who knows that they've got move it i presume is in a position where they're doing something about it but that it's all of the the unknown unknown that's um that's likely to become the issue next right and that's a big thing like when you deal with these sorts of issues we've seen in the past where if you motivate a large group of people to go look at something they're probably going to go look at it especially when they're bored um and incentivizing people is the next best option hmm. um if you incentivize people and say hey why don't you come have a look at this and if you find something well, yep. you know yeah um it's a good way of getting people to do these sorts of things um and it's a really good way of getting people to identify not just what you expect to find, but mm. looking at those little niche cases. They're looking for small ways. Maybe they find it has been not put under the primary domain, but it's put under some third party domain that you had from 20 years ago. Yeah. 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 For sure. For sure. All right, cool. We're hitting on time. So, so we'll wrap up uh, at this, um, you know, I guess where I close it and thank you for, thank you for the analysis, Adam. Like I know I, I kind of came in hot and said, all right, tell us everything, you know, you guys know at this point in time about move it and how we've seen it exploited. So I appreciate you unpacking some of that for us. Um, I think from, a, from a bug crowd standpoint, you know, one thing to call out for, for our customers and for folks still listening to this, you know, vulnerable disclosure programs. Um, I, I do think that's something that, you know, everyone should be considering there is this, to your point, this kind of altruist drive, and sometimes it's out of boredom. It can be for all sorts of different reasons. But when something like this happens on the internet, you get researchers that have the skills to go off and look for this stuff and find it where you might not expect it. They'll just go off and do that, and you'll get those reports in. <clears throat> Regardless, um, you know, the next step up from that is actually actively incentivizing and rewarding that. Uh, and this is actually something that we did for Log4j um, post kind of that whole trash fire. Uh, you know, working with organizations just looking for instances of Log4j because you know, that had they had that problem that I was I was uh, mentioning before. It's it's such a common piece of software that 
really you know trying to identify it everywhere it possibly exists so that it can be fixed is actually quite a difficult problem in and of itself so that's something that we could also do for move it um anyone who wants to reach out and um you know engage us and, and get some help with that feel free to do that and we'll we'll get things underway um and yeah it, you know the, the i guess the good news and landing on this part is that it, it is patchable um it's you know there's this software that's been released to, to actually fix the vulnerability it's been designed in such a way that you can actually apply that patch without dropping the system you know affecting availability of the system to the users so you don't have to wait for change windows in the same way that you would if you had to you know bounce the uh bounce the system itself um <clears throat> so there's really no reason not to go off and, and fix this um at, at, at a high level um so that's that's the upside um so yeah I, you know appreciate your time adam and uh yeah we'll, we'll we'll wrap it there thank you for joining us on today's security flash cheers <laughs>